Okay, so um, either you are joining us on um, a Zoom or you're joining us directly on uh, LinkedIn. Um, in both cases, it's great. And I thank you for being here. So we want to talk today about CAS. When and how is it set up and also why is it set up and what needs to be improved in relation to CAS? Well, so CAS is the Court of Arbitration for Sport and it was set up in 1984 by the International Olympic Committee, the IOC, which itself, the IOC, was created in 1894 by a Frenchman, Pierre de Coubertin, in order to promote Olympism as a philosophy of life, exalting and combining in a balanced whole the qualities of body, will, and mind. So with this great philosophy, the IOC noticed that there were quite a lot of disputes going on in, uh, in relation to the various um, races and, um, and um, um, competitions which were going on, which were organized by the IOC, and they therefore decided to set up this dispute resolution body, Court of Arbitration for Sports, CAS, which is set up, set up in Lausanne, in Switzerland. And there were quite a few reforms re that happened in relation to CAS and the way it is structured in 1990 and 1994. Indeed, further to a decision from March 1993, which was handed down by the Swiss Supreme Court, which is called the Swiss Federal Tribunal, the SFT, uh, Cass was found that it was uh, a, 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 pro a, a proper court of arbitration by the SFT, the Swiss Federal Tribunal, but the Swiss Federal Tribunal thought that Cass was insufficiently independent, both organizationally and financially, from the International Olympic Committee. So on the back of that, some reforms were made, uh, so that an International Council for Arbitration for Sports, ICAS, was created to look after the running and the financing of CAS on a day-to-day -day basis. Also, in 1993 and onwards, two types of arbitration procedures and divisions were put in place at CAS. The first one is the Ordinary Arbitration Division, which adjudicates sports related disputes except for um, uh, disputes relating to decisions taken by sports organizations such as disciplinary proceedings. So the ordinary arbitration division usually adjudicates um, commercial disputes relating to the execution of contracts or broadcasting contracts or media rights agreements or hosting contracts player transfers, employment agreements with coaches, players and clubs, and also sponsorship agreements and contracts with agents. So all these commercial agreements need to be related to sports, okay? And the ordinary arbitration division adjudicates on these cases, um, as well also on, as on disputes relating to civil liability claims and torts. So for example, in case of accidents which occur during races and competitions between athletes. And these disputes uh, uh, adjudicated by the Ordinary Arbitration Division are um, of sole instance, uh, which means that the CAS arbitral awards are final and may only be challenged before the Swiss uh, Federal Tribunal, the Swiss Supreme Court. And the other uh, uh, division which was set up at CAS in the uh, 1990s is the Appeals Arbitration Division, which is an appeal uh, uh, pr process of uh, decisions taken by national and international sports organizations uh, relating in particular to disciplinary proceedings. So since 1994, the, um, the Code of Sports Related Arbitration has uh, governed the organization and arbitration procedures of CAS. It's a 70 article code, which is divided in two parts. 
There's the statutes of bodies working for the settlement of sports-related disputes. So that's Article S1 to S26, and then there are the procedural rules. So today, as of today's date, the CURD STB's rules for four distinct uh, cast divisions. So the ordinary arbitration division, which we just mentioned, as uh, which relates to sports-related um, disputes, commercial and also um, taught, taught issues, and the appeals arbitration division, which we also just mentioned, which is competent to hear appeals against decisions issued by national federations, international federations, sports associations, and any other sports body, provided that such body st statutes set out that CAS should act as the final arbitration, arbitral instance with regards to this body's decision. And then there is also a, an ad hoc arbitration division, which was created in 1996 at CAS, which operates solely during Olympic Games, where and when time is of the essence, and uh, therefore the ad hoc decisions are handed down within 24 hours so that the Olympic competitions can take place. Okay, so this ad hoc arbitration divisions that actually has its own sets of rules of procedure, which are entitled arbitration rules for the Olympic Games. And you can actually have access to these rules as well as the um, code of sports related arbitration uh, rules that I just mentioned before in our article that we published yesterday on our websites, crefovi.com and crefovi.fr in the publication sections. And they are called sports arbitration and CAS, what key issues need to be addressed by CAS. So um, then there's a fourth, a fourth uh, division at CAS, which is the anti-doping division of CAS. CAS ADD, and it is established, it was established, sorry, to hear and decide anti-doping cases as a first instance authority or as a sole instance pursuant to a delegation of powers from the IOC, the International Olympic Committee, the International Federations of Sports uh, on the Olympic Program, and any other signatories to the World Anti-Doping Code. So why was CAS created? Um, so, as I mentioned before, the IOC noticed that there were starting to be some disputes during the uh, Olympic competitions, and so that's, that was the first reason why CAS was set up back in 1984. It is a way, CAS is a way to implement a uniform and streamlined system internationally to resolve sports dis disputes via a quick and usually inexpensive adjudication process. So it is the most successful arbitration body for sports with 8,000 cases submitted to CAS since 1984. So it's pretty successful. Among those cases, 80%, 8-0, 80 80% relate to disciplinary disputes, while 15% relate to commercial disputes. So one five. 15%. So the reason of this um, uh, discrepancy and um, an imbalance, so to speak, is that usually commercial actors like the brands or the broadcasting networks, they prefer to have arbitration clauses designating traditional arbitration institutions in their commercial agreements with sports uh, entities, organizations, or, or athletes and clubs. So usually the commercial actors prefer to designate the um, ICC or the London, the International Chamber of Commerce or the London Court of International Arbitration, LCIA, or JAMS or AAA, if you are based in the US, in their contracts. Okay, so 80% relate to disciplinary disputes, 15% relate to commercial disputes, and the rest relates to adult cases and also doping cases. Okay, so... I'm mentioning in passing that CAS does have a few content contenders as competitors, such as which which also provide arbitrations uh, and, and arbitral awards in relation to sports uh, competitions, such as the FIA courts uh, from the Fédération Internationale de l'Automobile, so FIA, which adjudicate um, international motor sports disputes, and also the Basketball Arbitral Tribunal, BAT, which is an independent body officially recognized by the International Basketball Federation and which provides services for rapid and simple resolution of disputes between players, agents and coaches and clubs for arbitration.
obviously, in the basketball field. And also two other um, arbitral institutions focusing on sports of note are the Qatar Sports Arbitration Foundation, as well as Sports Resolution, which the latter being based in London. Um, however, my understanding is that all these sports um, arbitration institutions have a caseload, which in comparison to um, CAS, CAS's caseload, uh, pale. I mean, they, they, it's, 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 CAS has got a much bigger caseload. So um, also another reason why CAS was, uh, was created is that CAS disputes are only adjudicated by a panel of arbitrat arbitrators who specialize in sports, sports law, and sports-related disputes. There are around 330 arbitrators at CAS on a closed list appointment system. So what does that mean, the term closed list appointment system? It means that instead of the established practice in arbitration of party appointed arbitrators, where the parties decide who is going to be the arbitrator, the appointment of arbitrators at CAS are made entirely um, uh, by relying on a cl the closed list of or um, of already pre-selected arbitrators designated by CAS. Okay, so the parties can only select arbitrators which are on this closed list um, set up by CAS. There are three hundred thirty names, so obviously there's still quite a lot of choice um, from there. But um, but it is a closed list. So these arbitrators have all been appointed by ICAS, this body I mentioned before, which now is in charge of the administration of CAS, in compliance with Article S14 of the code. So only arbitrators with appropriate legal training and recognized competence with regard to sports law and or international arbitration, a good knowledge of sport in general, and a good command of at least one CAS working language can be appointed by ICAS. So this guarantees that only expert arbitrators adjudicate CAS cases. So in relation to these official languages, French, English, and more recently Spanish are the three official languages at CAS for the arbitrations. So another reason why CAS was created is that for international sports disputes, it's, it is easier to enforce an arbitral award compared to a, a court judgment, thanks to the New York Convention on the Recognition and Enforcement of Foreign Arbitral Awards, dating 10th, June 1958, which has so many contracting states. So it's much easier to enforce a, um, an arbitral award than a court, a national court decision in any uh, uh, state on the planet of this earth, because there are way more, uh, there are way more parties, states which are contracting parties to the New York Convention. So it's easier to have an enforcement in any country in the world, like most countries in the world. So uh, also arbitration provides a certain degree of confidentiality of the proceedings, which cannot be mirrored by the court process handled by national judges, who often hand down very detailed judgments made public, obviously, upon the publication. And after some court hearings, which were open to members of the public. So, um, for example, in the, um, uh, in the appeals process the, um, uh, of, of CAS, of the uh, CAS Appeals Division, the rule of thumb is that these, uh, 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 these arbitrations are confidential except if the parties ask otherwise, but otherwise the rule of the, the default setting is that these uh, arbitrations um, adjudicated by CAS at, for, at appeals division are going to be confidential. So that is to a degree a relief um, to the, uh, the parties because uh, reputation of, and, and clout is obviously very important assets in the, um, in the, uh, um, sports industry and um and it's best that everything goes be, be behind closed doors so um 
yeah, and and also sorry, the ordinary arbitration procedure is confidential as well. Okay, so uh, the parties, arbitrators, and CAS staff are obliged not to disclose any information connected with the disputes. While in principle, uh, awards are not published by the division. Okay, um, so the appeals arbitration procedure does not specifically. Specific, specify particular rules of confidentiality, but the arbitrators and CAS staff also have a similar duty of confidentiality during the proceedings. And generally speaking, unless the parties agree otherwise, um, the award may be published by CAS uh, Appeals Arbitration Division, sometimes in a redacted format, but um, uh, very often they decide they decide uh, the party parties not to have the, uh, the award um, uh, published so uh, there's a there's a sort of um now that we've 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 actually um you know sort of laid out the um the template and uh, and the framework of what cas is and uh, how it came to be and um and uh, how long it's been going on and what is done so far um i would like to focus this um webinar on the fact that there are still quite a lot of hot topics and issues um, which have actually highlighted the weaknesses of a CAS uh, process, arbitration process, and also internal organization. Um, while I, I am in no way uh, attempting to, uh, um, you know, to um, denigrate CAS and its uh, um, very useful um, input to the, to the sports industry, there are there's still an enormous amount of room to improve its performance, um, its uh, processes and the way it handles and adjudicates cases um, in, in, you know, in, in now in the 21st century. So um, um, in particular, it's, these failings um, do have an impact on, on, on CAS's ability to ensure a fair, inclusive, independent and impartial and due process. Um, and that's to a degree, uh, undermines the CAS's aura and magnitude. And actually, uh, it's quite funny when you you Google, you know, CAS Court of Arbitration of Sports Switzerland um, in your in Google, you will see on the Google local um, reviews that there are many uh, basically. Uh, <laughs> one to two stars review uh, that were left by many people <laughs> on the Google reviews, which think that um, a cast is, uh, is, is, uh, is a farce, really. And um, so that's, that's quite interesting. There seems to be quite a lot of, sort of, um, of emotion uh, going on, especially in anti-doping cases and, and things we're going to talk about now. So the first big issue that CAS has to face and contend with is the lack of diversity in its closed list of arbitrators. Okay, so we've ex I've just explained the system of the closed list appointment and um, quite a lot of studies have been made in relation to the fact that um, while there is a general trend at the moment in the arbitration community uh, for more gender, geographic, and generational diversity in uh, in, in arbitrators' pool, CAS is uh, really uh, lagging behind on that. Um, and it's been specifically targeted for its lack of diversity and its inclusiveness, in inclusiveness in the closed roster of arbitrators appointed to hear disputes, with the former CAS arbitrator concluding that CAS retains the characteristics of the oldest network in sport, the old boys network, the old boys club, and an old Swiss boys club at that. Why? Because there are also quite a lot of uh, cast arbitrators who, who uh, are resident in Switzerland. Um, so with respect to gender, only 38, 38 of the 330 cast unique arbitrators are female, 11.5%. With female arbitrators receiving only 226 appointments, 4.5% compared to the 4,827 appointments given to male arbitrators. So male arbitrators get 95.5% of, uh, of um, appointments, while females get only 4.5% of our appointments. 
outrageous. Not only that, but a small number of male arbitrators were appointed by CAS in a disproportionately large number of procedures and arbitral proceedings. We will come back to this topic later. With respect to ethnicity, data reveals that only 6.2% of CAS controlled appointments were to non-white arbitrators and only 1% of CAS controlled appointments were to black arbitrators. Moreover, the CAS record of appointing female and or non-white arbitrators as sole arbitrators or panel presidents is particularly poor. So let me just rewind on this. So in arbitrations, um, the arbit arbitrators are usually um, working solo, okay, as a sole arbitrator, or as part of a tribunal, an arbit uh, arbit arbitration tribunal of three arbitrators with two um, wing arbitrators and one president, okay? So in relation to sole arbitrators and or panel presidents, um, CAS has got a particular poor uh, track record since um, it only appoints female or non-white arbitrators as sole arbitrators or panel presidents in 3.2% of cases. It's, it, I mean, when I read those figures, I was like, this is a disgrace. This is a disgrace. Arbitrate the diversity in CAS closed list is therefore a major issue compounded by the fact that so many cases are adjudicated by CAS in recent years related to non-white athletes and or female athletes. So how can these non-white and or female athletes may feel that CAS arbitrators will empathize with them and understand where they are coming from if there is a 96% chance that such CAS arbitrators adjudicating the case will be pale, male, and stale. So in response to all this criticism in relation to the lack of uh, inclusiveness, inclusiveness and diversity, um, and also in order to address several judgments from the Swiss Supreme Court, the SFT, which confirmed that while CAS was sufficiently independent, there were some challenges in operating with a closed list of arbitrators, ICAS appointed a number of new ICAS arbitrators, sorry, of, of new CAS arbitrators, which increased the number of arbitrators on the closed list to almost 400 individuals. <clears throat> okay, so the second issue that CAS has to contend with in order to become a proper um, arbitration body of the 21st century is to address its position in relation to gender and equality, as well as uniformity in sports regulations. Indeed, several arbitration cases have highlighted a growing divide between CASA's gender politics and the pragmatic reality in real life, which is that more and more athletes are naturally born as or choose to become gender fluid human beings. In July 2015, CAS handed down its appeal award on the dispute Duty Chand versus Athletics Federation of India and the International Association of Athletic Athletics Federations, the IAFF, IAAF, sorry. So what, what's that case about? Well, Ms. Chan was then, a, in, 19, uh, in 2015, a 19-year-old female track and field athlete of Indian nationality who won a number of national junior athletics events in India as well as gold medals in the women's 200 meter sprint and the women's four by 400 meter sprint relay at the Asian Junior Track and Field uh, Championship in Taipei in May, 2014. However, a few days before Ms. Chan was due to leave India to attend the World Junior Athletics Championships in Glasgow, Allegedly in compliance with the IAAF regulations governing 
eligibility of females with an hyperandrogenism to compete in women's competition, which from now on we're going to call the hyperandrogenism regulations, Ms. Chan was subjected to various medical examinations by the Sports Authority of India, an Indian government body. As a result, Ms. Chan was notified by a doctor working for the Sports Authority of India that she would not be permitted to compete in the forthcoming World Junior Athletics Championships and would not be eligible for selection for the Commonwealth Games because her male hormones, i.e. her androgens, levels were too high, i.e. she was diagnosed with hyperandrogenism. It's a medical condition, hyperandrogenism, where uh, females, are, female human beings, have very high level of uh, uh, androgens, so testosterone, um, and um, can show and, uh, and, uh, and display some uh, um, uh, some um, uh, traits such as um, a lot of hair on the face, on the on the on the limbs. Um, a, a low voice, um, also um, no breasts, and um, um, lean body mass, which is uh, closer to that of a man, so um, quite a lot of muscles. And um, so that's called hyperandrogenism, okay? So while Miss Chan doesn't really display these characteristics of hyperandrogenism, according to me, um, the Sports Authority of India decided that she was to be stopped from competing in the female category because her um, testosterone levels were uh, beyond the threshold of 10 nanomilliliter uh, per um, nanomoles per liter, apologies, uh, which was the threshold set out in the hyper, uh, hyperandrogenism regulations. So such decision of suspension uh, because of hyperandrogenism was notified by the um, uh, uh, IAAF uh, to Ms. Chand in August 2014 by way of letter, and she appealed this uh, suspension to CAS in September 2014. So in her statement of appeal, um, Ms. Ch Chand asked CAS to declare the hyperandrogenism regulations invalid and void and to also set aside the suspension letter and declare her eligible to compete. So CAS decided to actually grant Mrs. Chand's uh, requests because it decided that the IAAF had not brought sufficient evidence to CAS concerning the magnitude of a performance advantage that hyperandrogenic females may enjoy compared to other females as a result of a abnormally high um, testosterone levels. So since no such evidence had been filed by the IAF, then they uh, suspended the hyperandrogenism regulations and Ms. Chan was able to compete again. And uh, um, Cass, a panel of arbitrators asked the IAF to come back within a, a, a time period of two years um, in order with some appropriate and uh, additional evidence in relation to this uh, magnitude of, of, uh, of a performance advantage by hyperandrogenic uh, females may enjoy. Otherwise, the uh, hyperandrogenism uh, regulations would be declared null and void. So, um, yeah, so that was that in relation to the Chand versus IAF case from 2014 and 15. And then there was, and so I, I think that this is a fair decision, you know. Um, IAF says something, but it doesn't provide the evidence uh, proving that uh, a certain type of females with higher levels of androgen and testosterone would have a competitive advantage compared to other type of females. Uh, therefore, uh, it sets aside for such regulations. I think this is a very fair judgment uh, and um, um, and arbitral award made by Ka by by Cass and Miss Chand was able to compete. Yes, she lost one or two years, 
which she would never be able to recoup, but at least she didn't have to go through surgery to um, level uh, lower her levels of testosterone, or uh, she she will she she did not have at the time uh, the obligation to take some oral medication to um, medically lower her level of testosterone. But it doesn't end here. What happened is that there was a second case, a second um, uh, CAS award was handed down, uh, and this time it was relating to differences of sexual development, DSD, differences of sexual development in female track and uh, field athletes. And this second uh, award is Castasemania versus um, IAF again, this um, uh, federation of uh, federation, international federation of athletics based in Monaco, and this uh, second award, Castor uh, uh, Semenya, is from April 2019, and so the exact same CAS arbitration panel that in the duty chance case was uh, was appointed uh, for this uh, Semenya's case. And in this case, unfortunately, I think, it rejected Ms. Semenya's request to declare the IAF's eligibility regulations for the female classifications athlete with difference of sex development, which came into force on in November 2018. So it's called the DSD regulations, and it was basically a replacement uh, a, a, a set of regulations for, uh, for the uh, hyperandrogenism regulations. Okay, and so the CAS uh, panel in its um, decision from 2019 uh, uh, set aside the request to declare those DSD regulations unlawful. And so leveraging the, uh, the previous Duty Chan case law, the, the claimant, Ms. Semenya, as well as her South African uh, athletics uh, federation, so there were some, there were co-claimants in this case. So uh, they went for the jugular, really, really contending that the DSD regulations were discriminatory against athletes on the basis of sex and or gender because they only apply to female athletes and to female athletes having certain ph physiological traits. Indeed, there are no men athletes, no male athletes is being checked on their level of testosterone. Even a male who has a um, level of testosterone above 30 nanomol uh, per liter can, can compete in the, in the male uh, category. But for female, there's a limit um, in those DSD regulations between five nanomol per liter, sorry, between, um, yeah, up to five nano, uh, nanomol per liter. If a, a female is above uh, five nanomol per, per liter, then uh, she um, has to take some medication or surgery to lower her testosterone levels uh, under uh, five nanomol per liter for six months. And she needs to prove that for six months her testosterone levels were under, under five nanomoles per liter. So yeah, so uh, they were discriminatory uh, uh, based on the, uh, sex and gender because they only apply to female athletes and to female athletes having certain physiological traits. Also, these DSD regulations lacked a sound scientific basis, alleged castasemania. They were unnecessary to ensure fair competition within the female classification, according to the co-claimants, Miss Semenya and uh, Federation of South Africa, they were likely to cause grave, unjustified and irreparable harm to affected female athletes because, hey, who wants to undergo surgery to lower some testosterone levels? Nobody wants to do that. Um, they were likely to cause grave, unjustified, sorry, already mentioned that, they were unlawful and should be prevented from being brought into force on the basis of that they were unfairly discriminatory, arbitrary and disproportionate and therefore these DSD uh, regulations violated the IAF constitution, the Olympic Charter, the laws of Monaco, where I said earlier the IAF is incorporated, the laws of jurisdictions in which international athletes competitions are held, as well as universally recognized fundamental human rights. So that was, that. these were the arguments um, uh, laid by Ms. Semenya and the South African Athletics Federation. However, what happened is that in four years, right, since the uh, first decision, the uh, 2015 
uh, duty duty chain decision had been handed down, the IF had actually done its uh, legwork and had actually um, compiled a set of additional evidence proving that the um, that yes. Yes, indeed, the DSD regulations were discriminatory. Yes, that was recognized by uh, the uh, panel of arbitrators um, uh, as well as uh, the IAF. But these discriminations were necessary, reasonable, and proportionate means of attaining the legitimate objective of fair competition in the female category of elite competitive athletes. And, um, and, um, uh, in particular, uh, Cass thought that the new evidence, uh, which had been provided by the IAF since the uh, duty chance uh, uh, award, clearly supported the IAF's proposition that androgen sensitive women with elevated testosterone levels enjoyed a significant performance advantage over other female fleets. Also, the arbitration panel found that requiring DSD athletes to take oral contraceptives to lower testosterone in order to compete in the female category in the above mentioned restricted events was not of itself disproportionate. So let me just uh, rewind, uh, just backtrack here in relation to this oral contraceptives thing because uh, human beings who are not female might not really understand what that's about. Well, um, both male and female have uh, testosterone, okay, uh, uh, um, uh, hormones. However, if a female takes um, oral contraceptive pills, so the pill, then they will be getting more female hormones, um, and therefore this will lower the uh, level of uh, of uh, male hormones, androgens. Okay, so the PL is a good way to actually increase the level of uh, female hormones and decrease the the, the 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 testosterone levels. Okay, as well as also um, basically preventing a uh, 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 an egg from uh, from um, going out of the uh, of the uh, fallopian tubes of a woman every month. During uh, during the period, okay. Um, so so basically, coming back to the CAS um, uh, 2019 arbitral award, it, it did trigger an avalanche of criticism against CAS because CAS Tasmania could not compete in the female category, and there was no way she was going to compete in the male category um, because her performance was over. Ex, ex, at, 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 um, I mean, excellent, and uh, in the female category was still subpar um, in for the male uh, athletes. Okay, even a, a sort of mediocre male athletes would run faster than Miss Semenya, uh, who won actually several uh, uh, first gold medals for uh, track and field in the eight hundred uh, meters category in particular. So. Um, Miss Semenya lodged an appeal with the Swiss Supreme Court, the SFT, uh, to set a, but uh, but um, to set aside such award. But sadly, she lost her appeal with the uh, Swiss Federal Tribunal, and um, now she has actually lodged an application in 2021, in February 2021, with the European Court of uh, Human Rights in Strasbourg, in France, and this is still pending. So let's watch the space on that. So. My um, criticism of this award, this 2019 award, uh, Semenya, is that uh, the perfect effect of this uh, of this award is that female athletes with DSD, with uh, difference in sexual uh, development, and also transsexual athletes, i.e., athletes who identify as women, who were born male but identify as women. Now these two categories of athletes need to dope, they need to take drugs to lower the levels of endogenous testosterone below five nanomoles uh, per liter for extended periods of time prior to the races in order to be able to participate in the female classification in the eight restricted events at international athletics competition, the 400 
meter, the 800 meter, and the 1,500 meter races. So not only does it raise some questions, because why is it just to a particular type of uh, athletics competitions and not for example, for marathons or or an above 1,500 uh, millimeter race, why is it certain only 400, the 800, and the 1,500 meter race? And also, is it really appropriate that um, athletes have to take drugs to be able to compete? Uh, and um, my, my my so so about this particular targeted races, some people, some critics have actually said, yeah, because this is where Casta Semenya was racing. She was racing the 400, the 800, and the 1,500 millimeter meter race, and so that's why the IAF has only limited this uh, um, uh, restricted has only restricted this events to this 400, 800, and 1,500 meter race because they don't want Miss Semenya to actually race in the female category. This is what. Uh, going on, so that's the um, that's the criticism. And my 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 um, my uh, suggestion on this is: why not create a third category uh, uh, for gender fluid individuals, people who who are uh, uh, either um, uh, intersex at 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 birth or or uh, who have DSD, or and and also uh, transsexual athletes. Uh, who identify as women. So why not create a third category of races uh, where where it, they don't have to dope and they can keep the uh, endogenous levels of testosterone? I think that would be the way out of that. So I think that for the 2019 CAS Award, um, CAS has not been um, daring enough in it and, and, and strict enough with the IAAF because there is a third way to deal with this and the third way is to create a, a, a third category of gender fluid individuals be it by birth or by choice so here we can see that CAS is, is, is still a very conservative and um definitely not at the forefront of uh, of um uh inclusive inclusiveness and diversity in um, in in when when it's handing handing down its uh, its decisions and equality as well as uh, this there is a problem here that CAS needs to address. So quickly because time is uh, uh, running out, the third um, issue that um, I, I think needs to be really addressed by CAS is the lack of due process, which was especially important during the Pechstein case. So more than 13 years ago, the speed ice skater, Claudia Pechstein, who I believe is German, um, had to hand down an, a, a blood sample, which turned out to be abnormal. Uh, and she had to give that sample, which turned out to be abnormal, as part of a doping control. I mean, athletes, you know, who participate in, in competitions at an international level, they, they do this all the time. They do tests, anti, uh, d doping tests all the time. They just get checked all the time. So it was just like a, a regular uh, standard control, but it, it, it actually came out abnormal in Miss Peshton's case. So she was subsequently banned in July 2009 by the Lausanne-based International Skating Union, the ISU, for anti-doping violation for two years. So CAS confirmed this ban in his arbitral award, which was handed at the end of the um, year in 2009, in November 2009, and according to the cash rules in effect at the time, Ms. Pechstein was not entitled to a, a public hearing and a, a corresponding request for a public hearing that she had made was therefore uh, rejected. So Ms. Pechstein was also unsuccessful on appeal before the uh, Swiss Federal Tribunal in February 2010. Poor Ms. Pechstein. Well, especially since it was found that the litigious blood sample had only been conspicuous due to a genetically caused blood anomaly. So the poor woman had not even, you know, doped. It was just due to a, a, a blood anomaly that she had, you know, again, endogenously. And, um, and she paid a very, very high price for that poor woman. So what Miss um, Pechstein, uh, though, has got some balls, if I may say so. And so she appealed everything. <laughs> She appealed the SFT judgment to the European Court of Justice of, of Human Rights based in Strasbourg, that I mentioned before, because Miss Semania also now appealed the CAS decision.
uh, and the safety uh, judgment to the ESHR. And so uh, the ESHR uh, par uh, partially uh, ag agreed on the um, on the appeal by my by Miss Pechstein in its uh, decision from October 2018. And in particular, the European Court of Human Rights found that uh, CASA's refusal to grant a public hearing to Ms. Pechstein was a breach of Article 6.1 of the European Court Convention on Human Rights on the, uh, on the independence and impartiality of courts and tribunals. The European Court of Human Rights found that the um, impartiality and independence of CAS was seriously questioned in this matter, and that Ms. Pechstein was able to achieve part, um, sorry, and that she should have had the right to a public hearing. Um, so she was granted Ms. Pechstein some uh, damages. I mean, 8,000 8, euros or nothing when you've basically had your, your athletic career completely uh, destroyed, but at least it's that as a symbolic gesture. And um, so after the CAS, uh, sorry, the European Court of Human Rights judgment, CAS noted that it should have allowed a public hearing as Ms. Pechstein had requested one, and there was no specific reason to have denied it at the time. Also, the CAS rules were amended to the effect that in principle, public hearing proceedings may be requested, sorry, by the parties. I mean, I mentioned before that uh, by default, um, the uh, arbitral processes in CAS are uh, confidential. However, if one of the parties wants to ask for uh, the um, process and hearings to be public, um, he or she has the right to do so. And um, uh, CAS, of course, has got the uh, uh, ability to turn down such uh, requests if there are some uh, uh, reasons, uh, such as morals, public order, and national security, but otherwise you should grant his request for a public hearing. So, um, so if CAS's arbitration panels were to refuse to grant the, uh, the, uh, the right to a public hearing in the future, to, a, a, to an athlete or to a party, they better back themselves up very thoroughly in the awards to justify them invoking one of the exceptions to publicity. Otherwise, if a party requires for a public hearing, they should get it. So that is the third issue, the lack of due process um, that I think CAS needs to address in a much more flexible and um, pragmatic way. And then the la last issue that CAS has to seriously and very quickly address is the lack of impartiality and um, um, yeah, lack of impartiality uh, uh, from arbitrators on the CAS closed list. So we did mention earlier that there was a lack of diversity in the closed list of CAS arbitrators and also that some male, white male arbitrators had been appointed in a disproportionately large number of CAS arbitrations. In particular, 14 men, one four, 14 men have been appointed over 100 times by CAS. I mean, in this CAS, in this CAS um, uh, arbitration processes. I mean, that's really unbelievable. So this issue touches on both a lack of diversity and a lack also of impartiality with respect to CAS arbitrators. And it has come to the fore in a judgment from the Swiss Federal Tribunal, the Swiss Supreme Court, from uh, March 2022. In the CAS award challenge before the Swiss Federal Tribunal concerned a life ban from participating in football-related activities and a fine of 1 million Swiss francs imposed by the Fédération Internationale de Football Association, so FIFA, on an anonymous former football official in connection with the FIFA Gate scandal. So I refer you to uh, the FIFA Gate scandal. If you Google that, you'll get more information on Wikipedia, etc., or in our article, which you can have access to on crefovi.com, crefovi.fr, should you decide to subscribe to our uh, annual plan at um, on, on, on our websites. But so the FIFA Gate scandal, in a nutshell, is uh, people being very corrupted at the very high echelons of the management of FIFA 
uh, in particular Michel Platini, the uh, uh, ex uh football play uh, star football player for France he was uh, was indicted in this uh, FIFA gate scandal and so one of the officials i think from Brazil was um was basically banned for life uh, by uh, by through this CAS uh, award and also had this fine of 1 million Swiss francs imposed by FIFA okay so uh, the appellant so this guy who was banned um, first challenged both sanctions before CAS, which subsequently reduced the ban to 20 years as opposed to a life ban, and, but CAS upheld the fine of, of 1 million Swiss francs. Then the appellant, appellant failed, uh, filed a motion to set aside the award uh, based, among other things, on the ground that CAS arbitration panel had been irregularly constituted within the meaning of Article 1. 90 of the Swiss private international law as its president of the CAS panel lacked independence and impartiality. Uh-uh, what's that about? Well, it turned out, as the appellant demonstrated, that Mark Hovell, I think he's a British, British kind of lawyer, who was the president of the CAS panel of arbitrators, which handed down this, uh, this decision from uh, which, which was challenged before the SFT, had initially disclosed the fact that he was simultaneously chairing another, ch another case involving FIFA. But the appellant requested further disclosures, which were eventually made in October 2020, and these disclosures revealed that this guy, the president, Mark Hovell, of the past CAS panel of arbitrators, had been involved in no less than 10 additional ongoing arbitrations involving FIFA in two of which he had been appointed by FIFA itself. So uh, moreover, the, these disclosures revealed that a colleague of a president's law firm, uh, Mills and Reeve, had recently advised FIFA on a GDPR related matter. The SFT found that while Mr. Hovell's practice of known, not disclosing um, free appointments in three years, is inappropriate and contrary to the requirements of the duty of disclosure, you bet, there is no indication that such practice was the result of a deliberate attempt by the arbitrator to conceal certain information from the parties. So the SFT added that while the presence of non-disclosure could raise some questions, Sports arbitration instituted by CAS had has particularities such as the closed list of arbitrators. And since FIFA had participated in more than 400 CAS arbitrations during the relevant period, these questions did not raise legitimate doubts as to impartiality and independence in the absence of corroborate, corroborating circumstances, according to the SFT. So to cut the to the chase, that means that. FIFA was doing 400 CAS arbitrations at the time anyway. So this is why there was a big likelihood, according to the SFT, that Hovel would be um, appointed as a CAS arbitrator in more than just one uh, CAS arbitrations relating to FIFA. So um, although he should have disclosed the fact that he was uh, 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 um, appointed for several arbitrations, CAS arbitrations relating to FIFA, the SFT found that the fact that he um, was arbitrating other CAS arbitrations with FIFA was not a, uh, a, a, a fact that um, could uh, indicate that he was uh, not impartial and not independent. Although um, I completely disagree with that statement, but this is what the SFT went for. So since this judgment from SFT is highly controversial, recognizing that CAS arbitrators have the duties of disclosure, but giving a pass to Mr. Hovell despite the evident breach of such arbitrators' duties of, of disclosure, it remains to be seen if the appellant will turn to the European Court of Human Rights to reassess the lack of impartiality and independence of Mr. Hovell. Because when you get um, booted out by the SFT, the Swiss Federal Tribunal, then it seems that the next step would be, if you still are disgruntled by this uh, uh, rejection of your appeal, is to actually go to the European Court of um, Human Rights, so, such as uh, uh, Pestein or, or Semenya have done. So um, we'll see whether this Brazilian um, anonymous big ex-big big fish from, um, from the f football federations will appeal 
with the will uh, will apply with the uh, European Court of European Human Rights. I mean, failing that, and given the frequency of challenges in sports arbitration, it is only a matter of time, anyway, before we find out how the Swiss Federal Tribunal would examine a new case involving a more compelling breach of the duty of disclosure from a class arbitrator. So these are the four areas on which CAS has to do some work and improve uh, because it's really lagging behind and um, uh, yeah, at the moment really not being great. And but I'm confident, you know, with that um, CAS will become in the future a more inclusive, more diverse, fairer, and uh, ind more independent and impartial um, arbitration institution. Uh, which has a due process in place for sports arbitration. Thank you so much, everyone. It was great to have you here as my audience. And I would say to you until next time, bye.